Thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 148, The March on Moscow, Part 2. Last time, Operation Typhoon, Nazi Germany's quest to take Moscow, had been launched. Of course, Colonel General Guderian, a.k.a. Fast Heinz of the 2nd Panzer Group, had launched his attack to the south two days earlier. And it was this force that had the Stavka worried. Yet, starting at the most northern point of Operation Typhoon, now that all the Germans here were on the move, the Russians started reacting. As General Hoth's 3rd Panzer Group was able to purposefully hit the point where Lukin's 19th Army and Komenko's 30th Army met, this caused confusion for the defenders, as in who would take the defensive lead, which allowed the panzers to move forward some 10 kilometers or 6 miles during their initial thrust. But determined to stop them before they could gain any serious momentum, Colonel General Konev, commander of the Western Front, readied his artillery counterattack plans. So had three rifle divisions, along with a motorized group put under Komenko, who was told to blunt the German attack and turn it to the side. It would be hoping too much for the attacking force to actually be destroyed. Again, all the Russians had to do was to stop the Germans from reaching Moscow. As for those facing off against Guderian, Colonel General Aramenko, commander of the Bryansk Front to the south, withdrew a part of his front's forces to the Nurusa River, about halfway between the Germans' starting point and the city of Orel, to block the panzers from coming any further east. But again, the Russians were moving too slow. The orel kurtz kharkov access points, all to the south, were now dangerously exposed. Then Stalin stepped in. The situation in the south could not be allowed to unravel just two days into this latest offensive. Stalin ordered the 49th Army of the Reserve Front to head south by rail and halt the German advance. And then, thinking long-term, he also ordered the newly formed 1st Guards Rifle Corps, which had its own aviation group, a rarity for Soviet ground forces, to also head for the area to the south that had served as Guderian's starting point and wipe out all enemy forces there. Perhaps if the surging panzers had their rear threatened, they would pull back. As for the main attack, at least in the eyes of the Germans, along the main road, things were going equally well there. On October 3rd, the panzers of the more northern groups had penetrated further into the western front's area, as well as the reserve fronts behind them. The slow-moving Russians found themselves engaging or being engaged by the German units protecting the flanks of their more advanced comrades. Again, German experience and professionalism was paying off, but more of that in a moment. On that same day, October 3rd, Guderian was closing in on Orel, now some 200 kilometers or 120 miles deep behind the Bryansk Front's defensive line. Yet there was more bad news for the defenders. As Guderian bragged that his panzers would be entering Orel so unexpectedly that the people would still be on their way to work, his 47th Motorized Corps' 17th and 18th Panzer Divisions which had started out just to Guderian's left, had turned north after a few hours' travel, and were now almost in position to help surround several armies of the Bryansk Front. But making this task even easier, Eremenko had the 6th and 298th Rifle Divisions give chase of the encircling Germans as they were getting in behind the main line to the south. In essence, he was bringing the forces of the Bryansk Front into a smaller, concentrated area, making it easier for the 17th and 18th Panzer Divisions to trap them. By the end of October 3rd, Eremenko would realize this and request permission to move his men to better defensive positions. But this request was denied. No one wanted to be accused by Stalin of running away from a fight. For the Germans... Things were going as well as could be expected. 
Back on the main road that led from Smolensk to Moscow, the Germans' vision of the immediate future seemed to be unfolding. During the day, October 3rd, Hoth's 3rd Panzer Group had reached the Dnieper River, just east of Kolm, and now held two intact bridges. To have reached this far, the Panzers had to have gotten in between two armies of the Reserve Front, behind the Western Front. But the Russians weren't giving up, or giving in. Before the day was out, a massive tank battle commenced south of Kolm. On a side note, the northern part of the Western Front seemed to be, or was about to be, in the same precarious position as the Bryansk Front. General Bolden, Konev's deputy, who it may be remembered had the honor of being ordered to launch the first serious counterattack against Operation Barbarossa for the Western Front, of course back then, in late June, the Western Front consisted of the area just around Bielystok, was given the 126th and 152nd Rifle Divisions, the 101st Motorized Division, and the 126th and 128th Tank Brigades, and ordered to halt Hoth's advance. At first, Bolden just used his 128th Tank Brigade to hit Hoth from the south, as he, Hoth, was driving east on October 3rd. The idea was for the 128th Brigade to help pinch off the tip of Hoth's advancing forces, as the Soviet 207th Motorized and the 242nd Rifle Divisions hit it as well, moving southward. But that did not work. The Germans gave as good as they got, perhaps a bit better, and continued to move east. The next day, October 4th, Bolden threw in the rest of what he had. However, Hoth's men working together with their tanks, artillery, and planes, began the slow, arduous process of destroying the enemy in front of them. To be sure, they had to slow down to do this, but focused on the task with grim professionalism. The Russian forces were mowed down. The Germans doggedly moved forward throughout the day. Just south of this, Hopner's machines spent October 4th finishing off the Soviet 43rd Army, which they had first engaged two days ago, to then begin scattering the 33rd Army behind the 43rd. But now that that was done, many of Hopner's panzers, but not all, turned north to begin encircling the 20th and 24th Armies. With this maneuver, there was now a 115-kilometer or 69-mile-wide gap between the Reserve Front and the Bryansk Front, further south. As the sun was going down that day, major sections of the Western Front were being surrounded. There was a hole over 100 kilometers wide between the Northern and Southern Fronts, and the 10th and 2nd Panzer Divisions were now on their way to Vyazma, far into the rear of the Western Front, and deep inside the Reserve Front's area of responsibility. At the end of the fighting that day, Konev radioed Stalin and reported the dire news. Stalin did not give the order to retreat or redeploy further east. But before he could do anything else, their communications went down. So the Western, Reserve, and Bryansk fronts were not allowed to move back which helped the Germans encircle them in three enormous keels and many smaller ones besides. In essence, the Soviets to the north, on their right, were holding steady as the German panzers were able to get in behind them from above and below. Meanwhile, focusing on ever moving eastward, the Germans also had other panzer units moving east. By late October 4th, Hoth's and Hopner's spearheads were only 45 kilometers, or 15 miles, from Vyazma. Something had to change for the Russians, and quickly. Late on October 5th, Konev ordered Group Bolden, or what was left of it, to block the Germans from reaching Vyazma. This was wishful thinking, or an episode of suspended disbelief. Bolden's forces had been smacked around and shot up for the last 24 hours, trying to hold up the Germans nearest them. Now they, the Russians, were to somehow move east 
get ahead of the most advanced panzers and stop them from reaching the city of Viasma. However, just like at Bielestock, Bolden did his best to implement this ridiculous order. At least this time, as Bolden hit the Germans from the north, he would be joined by the 16th Army that was coming up from the south. Not that it would make any difference. And now for the tragic comedy. Just one hour after ordering Bolden to move against the Panzers, a hopeless gesture that would only end in more Soviet deaths, word came from Moscow. Stalin had given permission for all three fronts to retreat further east. Konev had not exactly asked Stalin could he withdraw. He loved living too much, but was simply reporting honestly on the deteriorating situation. Still, the order was given. But more besides, Stalin, on that same day, October 5th, had ordered Zhukov to return to the capital from Leningrad and called on the reserve forces of the northwestern and southwestern fronts to come to Moscow forthwith. Yes, the Soviet armies had been beaten again. More of their armies would be surrounded and annihilated again. The Germans were still coming, and yet there were more men for Moscow to draw upon. On the morning of October 6th, Konev told the 16th and what was left of the 19th Army to start making their way east to assemble near Vyazma. Then the 19th, as it was the more intact unit, would protect the areas to the north and south of the city. But such was Roskazovsky's 16th Army's situation, it was currently heavily engaged, that had it attempted to pull back and move east, the German force it was engaged with would have shot it down to the last man. Thus the 16th was unable to comply. Within 12 hours, late on October 6th, Vyazma fell to the Germans. But there was more. Around the same time that Vyazma succumbed to the Germans, to the south, Guderian's 17th Panzer Division was approaching the city of Bryansk, just behind the original defensive line. True, there were German panzers already behind this city, but they were further to the south and heading for Orel. But just before the 17th Panzer entered the city, it turned south and dashed for Eremenko's Bryansk Front Headquarters. As it was only 11 kilometers or 6.5 miles south of the town, it was come upon before the Russians realized this new direct threat. Still, the Russians offered up a fierce fight, but they were overwhelmed. Just before all organized resistance crumbled, the officers of Aramenko's intelligence, operation, and communications departments fled to the northeast. As for Aramenko himself, he departed along a different route, hours later, with his adjutant and some of his soldiers. They, too, headed to the northeast, where another keel, or encirclement, was shaping up. By the time he got to 3rd Army's headquarters at Zindra, it, too, was surrounded and fighting off the Germans, with only one army. His more fortunate departmental staffs had, by this time, traveled, or fled, further to the northeast. Bryansk was then moved against by the 17th Panzer, and captured, while the 18th Panzer, just to its north, linked up with other Panzer units there. Now, just to the northeast of Bryansk, near Zizdra, the Soviet 3rd and 13th Armies, along with Aramenko himself, and the 50th Army, just a bit to the north of him, were also surrounded. Hoping not to share the fate of these armies, just north of Zizdra, the 19th, 20th, and 24th armies began to retreat to the east. This had commenced on October 6th, per Stalin's belated order. But while the 19th and the 20th armies made it clear of the trap, the 24th lost most of its men and equipment as sections of it were encircled and then destroyed. Still more north of this, just west of Vyazma along the main road, 
The Germans, already having taken Vyazma, set up concentrated lines just west of the city, which entrapped the Soviet 16th and parts of five other Soviet armies. As covered, the same situation also existed along the Bryansk front to the south. Hitler, somewhat relieved, could not help but crow. His radio stations declared, The enemy has been broken and will never rise again. Posters were thrown up on buildings in Berlin that read, The outcome of the march to the east has been decided, along with, The last combat-capable Soviet divisions are sacrificed. And while this was not technically true, Stalin's cupboard of reserve armies, no matter how fast they could be thrown together, had never been so bare. As the situation stood, there was now a 500-kilometer or 300-mile tear in the Western Front, and the strategic reserves had been sent south to deal with the headaches being caused by Guderian. But on October 8th, Zhukov had made his way to Moscow. On that day, Zhukov told the Stavka, the chief danger is that almost all routes to Moscow are open, and the weak protection along the Moshiak line cannot guarantee against the surprise appearance of enemy armored forces before Moscow. We must quickly assemble forces from wherever we can at the Moshiav defensive line. This was to be their latest salvation. But that was for the soldiers and higher-ranking officers. As for the various government agencies that had kept Soviet Russia in the war thus far, it was time to face the truth. Moscow prepared to evacuate. Whatever could not be taken away would be destroyed. Entire departments made plans to leave. As for the Morshirak defensive line, it was to be manned by the 110th and 113th Rifle Divisions. They were now a part of the new 5th Army. Joining them would be whatever Stavka reserve units were already stationed at the line. Not that there was much. Also, the newly created Moscow Reserve Front was established, at least on paper, which would be manned by the various armies still on their way from the north and south of Moscow. As for the equally threatened area to the south of the main road, Lieutenant General Sokolov's 26th Army would have the task of stopping Guderian's panzers. Of course, it was undermanned and under-equipped, but at least on paper, Moscow's latest defensive dispositions were taking shape. As for the numerous armies of the Western and Reserve Fronts that were still trapped, they were now under the direct command of Zhukov, and renamed the New Western Front. Zhukov, as was his wont, got to work. The trapped forces to the west of Vyazma were ordered on the night of October 10th and 11th to penetrate the enemy's defensive line and escape encirclement, at all costs. But these were just words on paper. Before them, to their east, just before Vyazma, was a wall of German panzers. But to the detriment of these trapped men, and those that had them trapped, the weather on October 7th changed again. The quagmire that was the Rasputista had come. Still, the Russians trudged east. On October 10th, Lieutenant General Lukin, in charge of this latest escape, reported the situation of the encircled forces has worsened sharply. There are few shells. Bullets are running out, and there is no food. They eat that which the population can provide, and horse flesh. Medicines and dressing materials are used up. All tents and dwellings are overflowing with wounded. But still, the men tried. What other choice did they have? And in their attempt would be the end of the original Western and Reserve fronts. When you hire your local Serta Pro painters, you get the power of doing it right. Detailed project proposals. 
excellent customer service, and trusted professionals who get the job done on time and on budget. The power of experience. We're kings of the scaffolding and pros with the stucco. We've been there, done that. Get your project started at CertaPro.com and get the power of pro. Each CertaPro painter's business is independently owned and operated.